A preacher's kid. I would say that there are some seats up front, and so feel free to, to, to come forward. And um, please turn your cell phones off, if you don't mind. And I don't bite. And she doesn't bite. You heard it from her. All right. It's a trap. It's a trap. Do we need more chairs in the back? I think there are some chairs back there, right? Um, and we're recording, and I don't think we're going to get much of the audience in the recording, but if you have a, an objection to being recorded at this subversive gathering, <laughs> then you please let us know. Okay? All right. It's good to see each of you. I'm going to start a uh, sign-up sheet around, and just if you feel like it, put your email, your name and your email. And, and uh, and, and if you don't have an email, put your, um, put your address, because we, we don't call, but we do send in the mail or do email, okay? First, I want to welcome you to the Pillsbury House. I don't know how many of you have been here before, but the Pillsbury House is, um, is in the midst of a makeover. And that makeover has to do with making it a, an art-centered community uh, service agency. Um, thus, you have Pillsbury Theater in inside of here. You have Upstream, Upstream Arts that deals with people with mental uh, disabilities in here. You have a daycare. You have um, a church actually is in this space on Sunday and in the basement. Um, you have a free health clinic upstairs um, that also does healing arts. And then you have Obsidian Arts. And I'm with Obsidian Arts and we were invited here specifically because of their desire to create some synergy around um, the arts and people's wellness and what they know. I wanted to just point out some um, papers that we had at the table when you come in. Um, we do uh, trips to Cuba, and so we've got some sheets on the, on the Cuban trips we do. We do. Um, maybe someday we'll visit Honduras. <laughs> we also have an exhibition down in the lobby called African Impulse. It is an exhibition of works by um, African artists who are in Minnesota, and it's, and it's their take on the Minnesota experience. And so check them out. Some are very funny, some are very tragic. Um, we also are, after this um, talk ends, we're having a little, uh, I guess I'd call it a nibbly party. So if, um, while I know this conversation is going to leave you hungry, hungry for more um, engagement, uh, more, um, more um, people power. It also might leave you a little bit hungry for some nibblies. And so I have a map to the location. It's just about four blocks from here. Um, a friend, Gina Shannon, has agreed to open her home. And so feel free to come by. There's no charge, of course. It's just a type of fellowship, maybe outside of this, um, this sort of more structured engagement. Um, that being said, while it's a structured engagement, we do um, want to say, feel free to ask your questions. For gosh sakes, how can we have these two men and August um, in our space, in our space, in our space, and not take advantage of the burning questions that either you have uh, before you came or that you have as you're hearing the conversation. Excuse me, can you say your name too? Please? Thank you very much. Usually people just want to call me the guy that talks. <laughs> but my name, I'm sorry, my name is Roderick Salfo and I'm with Obsidian Arts. Um, which you'll, you can, in the, in the little pamphlet here, you see a bit about what we do. I also want to say before I uh, introduce them, how many of you have been to the Cuban <coughs> Film Fest? <laughs> and to that I would say, well, you've got to do better. So there are brochures. There are brochures in the back, and please take a moment to go because they're fantastic films. All right. <clears throat> um, Ariel Reyes. This is Ariel in the middle. Feel <laughs> free clap. Is a visiting scholar from Cuba working at St. Thomas University and has a degree in international relationships from the Instituto Superior de Relaciones uh, Internationales and a degree from, uh, in sociology from the University of Havana. For more than 16 years, he has worked in political and social research at the Academy of Sciences at the University of Havana. In recent years, he has dedicated himself to the theme of social movements in the United States and aspects of the historic conflict between both countries. He has participated in national and international meetings as a researcher in various North American universities. 
He has received major awards from the Academy of Sciences of Cuba for the results of his research work on the social demographic study of the plan Turquino? 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 And the National Study on Biological Diversity. He has also received a Scientific Merit Award given by the Ministry of Higher Education. And that is Ariel Reyes! <laughs> Next we have Luther Castillo, he is a Garifuna, Afro-Honduran, doctor and activist who founded the hospital, uh-oh, Lou, we were going over this, so I'm going to try to do it as well, um, Lu, Lu Agu, uh, Hot Twadi, Wadu, Hienu, Hienu, Henyo, Henyo, um, uh, or for the health of our people. What a great name, right? What a great name. Um, serving 20,000 people where no medical facility facility previously existed. 60,000. 60? Wow. 60. 60,000. Um, he was educated at the Latin American School of Medicine in Cuba and was featured in, do in the documentary Salud. After the June 209 military coup in Honduras, he was a spokesperson for the popular resistance to the coup to the coup, and was labeled public enemy number one by the military, which issued a shoot-to-kill order. That forced Luther into exile. While in exile, he led a medical relief delegation to Haiti in 2012? Okay, I might have been typing to the 2011, after the earthquake, and a delegation of 700 graduates from the Latin American School of Medicine that was put together by Cuba. Obsidian Arts, is thrilled to be working with the Minnesota Cuba Committee, and we are thrilled that we got the chance to host these two brothers, these three brothers, together in a dialogue. First, we're going to ask each in turn, first Ariel and Luther, to talk about um, your purpose, the purpose of your work, and current work endeavors for maybe two to three minutes, and then we'll have a conversation on the experience of Afro descendants in the Caribbean. Okay. <laughs> and feel free to stand up if you, if, because we've got a lot of people. We've got a lot of people, so um, feel free to stand up if you need to move your bird voice back into the room. of my English is not as well as I wish, I would like to express my main ideas in English. I'm professor of the Havana University. I was working during four or five years in the Cuban intersection in Washington. And uh, after that, I moved to the foreign, I moved off the foreign affair for the science academy in Cuba. When I finished my work in academic I moved to the Center of the Story of the United States, and I work in there until now. My main work has been always some connection between U.S. and Cuba, and uh, specifically with the social movement and what is happening in the U.S. society and what is happening in Cuba. In order to do some comparison about uh, those realities, very little. My time and now as here as visiting professor of the St. Thomas University with the idea to prepare some books about the uh, environmental relation between Europe, U.S. and Cuba. And in the, at the same time, we are going to do some work about what is the role of the Cuban in the, of the Cuban in this state because it's very easy to understand why the QR are in Miami. But it's not easy to understand why the Q are here. And for the reason we are looking maybe at some a little crisis. Oh, but the most important thing is that they are here, they are working here, they are, they are enjoying this time in this in the state. 
and the, the other things that we have to wear is in order to know something about the, the environment, in the, the environment problem in this state, and some connection with the with Canadians and the, the Great Lake, something like that. This is all my, my, general, my general proposal to stay here. I retire to say you thanks by me, and it is a pleasure for me. Good afternoon, everyone. Good night. Uh, and, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here with Professor Ariel and with you. And uh, as you know, I'm from Honduras. I, uh, I went to med school in Cuba, a beautiful private Latin American school of medicine. After the hurricane Mish, we destroyed part of Central America. Cuba was one of the countries who sent uh, the doctors of Honduras and uh, working in the more, most remote areas in Honduras. And afterward, the Cuban government was thinking what we can do to continue supporting those communities who was very affected by the work and niche. Then they decided to open the Latin American School of Medicine. First, it was specifically for countries in Central America, and after, get a little bit more bigger, and now, the Latin American School of Medicine have been graduating since 2005 until now, more than 10,000 doctors from 38 different countries under the conception, philosophy of solidarity and humanity, and willing to go wherever. And doctors, revolutionary doctors, who can feel in the bottom of their heart any injustice in any part of the world. Thus, concept give us the opportunity to travel to Haiti for the earthquake and accompanying our brothers and sisters from Haiti with 726 doctors from 26 different countries, all of them trained in Cuba and Latin American School of Medicine. Then, since my graduation in 2005, I returned back to Honduras and to set and practice the concept of the creation of Latin American School of Medicine. Then we decide to start with the communities a marvelous project to build a facility. But the first idea it was how we can design a strategy to create an alternative model of healthcare that's going to be free for patients and underdeveloping countries. Then this is the work what we are doing now. It's a great honor for me to be here. That's why we have to mention Cuba. Because in this little island, we got the opportunity for the parts of the world to train as a men and women of science and consciousness. Even though my English is not very well, but I'm trying. Okay. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, August Nimson. I'm with the Minnesota Cuba Committee. It's a real honor for me to be here with uh, Ariel and uh, with uh, Luther. Ever since I saw for the first time the film uh, Salute, some of you may have seen the film Salute, and it was a real inspiration. And a little that I ever think I would have an opportunity actually to be here uh, with Luther as a part of a, a program. Uh, and Ariel, whom I've known for more than a decade, uh, Ariel was here in the Twin Cities, uh, it was in the year 2000. I think it was at St. At St. Thomas. And uh, so this is his second trip, and so we've known each other for some time. So what we thought, at the Minnesota Cuba Committee, we were having a meeting one night, we realized that both of them were gonna be in town. And so we decided, we thought it'd be a great idea to have a discussion with them. Uh, they are both products of the Cuban Revolution in different ways, they are different generations, and we thought it'd be useful for them to have an informal discussion about their experiences, how has the revolution affected them? Uh, Ariel has a very rich experience. Uh, he comes from an earlier generation, uh, saw what it was like in Cuba before the, before the revolution, uh, the changes that have taken place uh, uh, for African, uh, Afro-Cubans, and uh, we thought it might be good to uh, have that kind of discussion. And uh, I realized as I was sitting here thinking, uh, I'm 
from New Orleans, and I mention that because we sometimes say New Orleans is the most northern city in the Caribbean. <laughs> and so uh, we, have, we share a lot uh, with the, uh, both uh, with Cuba, New Orleans' history, the ties, the, the founding document in New Orleans is actually in Havana. Uh, uh, the music uh, of New Orleans has its roots uh, in Cuba. And uh, before the revolution, there were very close ties. And I'm very, as a kid, uh, uh, I'm old enough to remember uh, the Jim Crow system in New Orleans, what it was like uh, uh, before the Cuban uh, Revolution. Uh, and uh, remember, I have very fond memories of always wanted to, to go to Cuba. And the first time I did, I realized being in Havana was in many ways being in my old neighborhood uh, uh, in New Orleans. So I'll be part of this discussion also, too. But I thought it might be a good way to kick off the discussion to ask Ariel just to say a little bit about what, what, what was it like uh, in, in the good old days <laughs> before, before the, uh, to be a black person, to be a black person in Cuba. And uh, how have you benefited? What would have been the changes in you've seen? In order to understand the, the benefits of the black in Cuba, it's uh, necessary maybe to make a brief uh, question about uh, how has been the, the Cuban revolutionary process. And uh, the most important thing is that the, when the revolution time, the, the government decided to open the, the door of the opportunity for all people, but not all people in the Cuban society there was ready to obtain all those opportunities. Because uh, we have a, a history of racism uh, before the revolution, a history of discrimination, a history of exploitation in the Cuban society. But despite of this, we must take, take into account that the Cuban uh, society has been uh, made together with the old Cuban race. Uh, in all the moment, in the, all the important moment of the Cuban society, black, white, and uh, mulattoes, or Chinese people, they're mixed together in order to obtain the freedom, fighting against the Spain. They move together uh, to obtain the freedom, fight, fighting against the, the US domination. And uh, this is the most important. Despite of the moment of the revolution, there is a gap uh, between different uh, societies, different level in the Cuban society. But the real history is that the Cuban mixed together. We have, uh, we have, uh, we have to, to show you, to present you this idea, because we consider that it, this is the most important thing. The racism in Cuba is not like the racism in the United States. Because in the case of the Cuban, uh, we, we have a Spanish here as the, as the civilization that explodes all. And uh, but what's happening with the Spanish? Uh, don't forget that the Spanish was uh, occupied by the Moro people for more than eight centuries. And it is impossible to find in Spain some people have, have been pure white. And those are the Spain who moved to Cuba. The only thing that they, they, when they established the, uh, the, the, the condition in Cuba, they have another conception of the, of the, of the, conception of the race because they permit of the slave of the right Cuba, they permit some kind of relation with the Spanish. They permit, uh, they get married, they have the opportunity, they go together for the, for the church, they have the opportunity to move in the society, mixing uh, <coughs> Spanish and black. It's, it, it's, it is a, it's a great difference. It's not happening in the United States. The black in the United States has never been the opportunity to mix with the white people. They have no opportunity to marry with the, with the white women or white men. And uh, the other difference 
is that the uh, is that the in the economic plantation system the the slaves have the opportunity during the weekend they have their own cultural activity they have their own religious activity and that this is one of the it, it no means that the that the Spain were really very good because any kind of exploitation is good but uh, it's important to take into account those differences. And uh, as I told you before, when the revolution tried, uh, the opening of the opportunities was, was where for all the people But, but the problem with, the, with the, the, the race in Cuba is that the, despite, of the, uh, despite of the revolution, it began to establish some uh, a national education system, and uh, they start to improve the participation of the of the old race in all the all the activity of the Cuba, and they, at the same time we are member. We have opportunity to be member of the army force, member of the of the communist party, member of the all organization that the system Cuba, black and white move together in all organization. At the same time, they have the, the main opportunity to, to, to go to, to the school at the high level. The university was open free, the education was open free, and the, the medicine, a sport, and a lot of things. But when at the end of the 50 years now, you see, you must, you must to see that maybe there exists some difference <coughs> between black and white. But let me to tell you something. When we are talking about black and white in Cuba, it's only mean the color of the skin. It's no mean a difference, a race difference. <coughs> it is only the color of the skin. Because in Cuba, it's impossible to talk about a white people or to talk about a black people, pure, because we have no pure in any, in any part of the, or in, in any moment of the the other thing is that the government have the, the conception that the, the, the Cuban constitution said that we, we, we must to uh, disappear, we must to eliminate all kind of, of racism that will be exist in the Cuban society. The other thing that, they, that is important to know, uh, Cuba has a lot of priorities. Uh, uh, I, would, I would like to mention one, two or three of them. The main priorities that the Cuban society has is to solve the problem of the food for the people. You are in the development country. We have no too much uh, natural resource. We, uh, we have no rich. And we have, after that, we have also the situation with the relation with the United States, the blockade, that they don't permit Cuba to obtain medicine, and don't permit to Cuba to obtain the benefits of this kind of economic relation. The other things, the other priorities after the food of the people is the, the problem of the health, how to solve the health for the people. It is important, maybe the doctor will be explain which is the, the national health system, and it is a, one of the priorities of the government. The other priority is the, the problem with the youth, uh, with the population in, the population in general, because you know, our po po population is moving to be most old, and we have not the most youth, youth now, and the youth are moving for other part of the world, they are selecting to move for other part of the world. And the, in our case, the, the, the fissure of the population is, is increased to most all the person and not to most of the use people. The other problem that the revolution or the government must to say is the problem of the, uh, the women uh, participation in order to increase that is important because in Cuba the, the population the, 
majority of the, uh, the of our professionals now, they are women. And uh, we have a lot of doctors, engineers, who, uh, <coughs> at the same time in the university, when you go to the different level of the university, the, the, the main uh, students, they are, they are women. It is important, uh, very important, because the women uh, must be a, a important role in the, all the society. But they, our women, they don't want to uh, to get. Uh, they don't want to tener uh, They don't want to be bad. They, they, they don't want to to, take, to have children. And uh, for the reason, our population is not increasing. And uh, this is one of the priorities of the government: order to stimulate the women to to have children. The other problem of the Cuban society has is a, is a, is a race relation because despite of our constitution, they don't accept any kind of discrimination. Despite of the, our constitution, uh, is writing clearly that the all Cuban are the same thing. We have no problem with the, with the race. If you go to the, maybe the, the best way, I'm, I'm sociologist, and maybe the best play to know who, who is the real integration in the social society, I invite you to go to the cemetery, to the cemetery in the moment that the person go to go away, and you will be all the person that go together with the, with the family, and this is a good <coughs> sociological test to know how it in the, how is integrating the social the social the other moment to see this uh, kind of, of expression of the of the me when you go to some wedding uh, the, or some party and you have the chance to go to the wedding the party all the people when you arrive at the uh, wedding palace you will be a mix of the people white black no black no no, it is a it is a great difference when you move to the some some concentration in the square, the revolution square. You will have the opportunity to see the people. The other thing that you must take into account is the how is the Cuban the psychology. The Cubans we had the we had as nationality. <coughs> We have uh, some idea that we, we are the best of the world because we have the idea that we have opinion on a lot of things. We, we you are talking about the baseball, the Cuban no baseball. You are talking about the moon, the Cuban moon. You are talking about how to plant the race, uh, the, the Cuban know how is that. If you want to talk about the medicine, the Cuban. You want to play baseball, the Cuban no. Because we we think that we are the the main of the world. This is for this reason we are talking about a lot of things. We 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 have opinion of a lot of things. And but you must take into account also, it is important that the Cuban has been able uh, remember that we are talking about some uh, nationality that have no more than the five years and uh, five centuries. And uh, the, the same thing is that the as nationality, we have, uh, we are fighting against the Spain <coughs> in some moment. We are fighting against the US government in some moment. And uh, by the way, the second governor of the United States in Cuba, in the second moment of the United States in <coughs> state in Cuba was uh, Minnesota. And the, the other thing that we are fighting again uh, in some moment, we are fighting against the Russian, we are fighting against the Chinese, we are fighting everywhere. This is a, this is a peculiar of the Cuban citizens. And for this reason, but in those moments of the, our history, black, white, mulattoes, and Chinese, they are moved together because we have four, uh, four branches, uh, Spanish, uh, slave, uh, Chinese, and, uh, and Indian, uh, our Indian uh, 
not to Mosingen because they has been not defeated but for the Spanish. But the problem is that the, this confrontation between the Spanish and Indian and the Cuban Indian is uh, the problem the some disease that the Spain have as the Qatar or something like that provoke in India to most disease. That's it. that is the real situation. We will be able to talk about uh, this problem during uh, two or three hours, but those are the main uh, the main ideas. The, the, the comparison of the racism in Cuba is, has never been like in the United States. The comparison with the Cuban reality has never been like the United States. We have another society, we have another reality, we have another history, we have another uh, way to see the land. The other thing is that the, according with my memory, in the only case that the Cuban decide to use only the black people to go to the fight was in the moment of the war in Angola or in Africa war. That was the, the only moment that the great troops of uh, Cuban, the black people moved outside of the Cuban in order to fight because this was a way, uh, this was a strategic way in order to establish good relations with the African and social like that. But in other moments, in the all this moment of the revolution, before the after the revolution, the black people has been working together. We have maybe I have not the the figure, but I'm sure that we have in this moment a, a lot of uh, black doctors, engineers, soldiers, uh, and a lot of people that want to decide to go away, or want to decide to move to other part of the world. This is a uh, my main perception of the of the race in Cuba. I'm open to to ask all the questions that you have uh, in this moment. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, have time for questions and so on. And I just want to ask uh, Luth to reflect a little bit on the uh, Afro Honduran uh, experience and in uh, uh, contrast and compare that to uh, to Cuba. <coughs> Then the reality of the Afro-descendants people in Honduras, uh, in this case, has become more uh, next to the reality of Afro-descendant people in the United States. No. It's even is the same uh, context and reality of Afro-descendant people in many other parts of Latin America, with a common uh, exclusion and racism. And my country is one of the most racist country I have been visiting in the world. And uh, it's the same of the reality of Afro descendant people in all Central America. And most of the country in Latin America that I have been visiting is the people of lack of education, lack access to the education, lack, lack access to the health care. And even doing now, the society, they have to fight because they are poor and fight because they are black and fight because they are women. This means that they have to have a three or two battle to survive. The history of black Afro-descendants people in Honduras, Garifuna, who was arriving to arrive to Honduras in 1797, and it was the 12th of April. My grandparent, my grandfather used to say it was on Wednesday, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Some years ago, yeah. and in a few days, we're going to be uh, 215 years of Garifuna arrival to Honduras. It's coming from St. Vincent. History said it was a five big boat. We stopped in front of the island of St. Vincent and the control of French and British to interchange men and women that they brought from Africa for slavery. They killed the slave master in front of the island of St. Vincent free all the six big, six big boats and run away to the island of St. Vincent and build there in the mountain a big uh, community of Cimarron people. Then in the island of St. Vincent, they were living Red Caribs and Arabic who came from the river of Orinoco in Venezuela. And there was a war between Arabacs and Caribs. And from that action, then Arabic, Caribs killed all the Arabacs men and took the women. And from that mix become Amerindian people. 
who was very discriminated in St. Vincent because they were product of Hawaii. Then this new arrival of African people who came for slavery and never become slave. And I want to point that action because we keep our spirit of uh, freedom of American people. And uh, they mix with Amerindian. From that mix from Amerindian and those arrival men and women from Africa become the Garifuna people. But British afterward was thinking how they can <laughs> would be very economic to re-enslave black people from newborn in St. Vincent, then they won't do that trip to Africa. They, they start to they start the plan to re-enslave black people, Garifuna newborn in St. Vincent. Then there was a war between Garifuna and British for 10 years. And Chief Joseph Satouye killed John Williams, who was the head of the army who was commanded in the war <coughs> in, against the Garifuna in San Vincent. Then they decide to call the leaders of Garifuna to sign an uh, agreement for peace. Then that night they killed Joseph Satouye and they start to capture the men and women of Garifuna who were resistance in fighting. And they captured 4,800. And they ship it to a, to a jail, open jail, in the island of Baliso, who is a desert island in the north of San Vincent. In this desert island, British killed 2,800 Garifuna. Then the other remnant who was, who was stayed alive, they put it in three boats and ship it to Honduras. That means that <laughs> we can have the same reality. We, we have maybe different history than the process in Cuba, because we, we face, we have been fighting for life since we left Africa to St. Vincent. Fighting for life in St. Vincent, exiled from, and we are now in Honduras and the reality in front of the, the third exile. When we arrived to Honduras 1797, 12th of April, our ancestors decided to took the part of the Atlantic coast. It was not a gift. It was because we joined Francisco Morazan in the battle for liberation of the country. More than 2,000 men joined the army with Francisco Morazan under the commander of Juan Francisco Bulnes. Many, some of the Honduran even didn't know that because history don't talk about us. Something that can become something new even for my people from Honduras. But 2,000 men was in the army with General Juan Francisco Bulnes, Walumu, commander all the process of all the fight in the Atlantic coast. Then General Francisco Morazan gave him the paper for all the, the honor of the land for the Garifuna community, 52 Garifuna along the Atlantic coast in Honduras. They were saying that we were waiting for Christopher Columbus before, and we smell like a fish. But now, all those big company and government is changing the law of the Constitution to sell our land to the more biggest company to build the biggest hotels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then, now we are not waiting for Christopher Columbus. <coughs> now they want to take us out of the land that our ancestors select to leave. Then, it's difficult because only the people who feel the discrimination can talk about it. It will be difficult to say you can have solidarity with people who feel the discrimination. But it's difficult to, <laughs> to express yourself good about it when you... Then, we live in a country where we have to survive for education. Live in the more remote areas without access to education. You have to leave the village and go to the city. And many of all those children have to see die their dreams. Then their mind become a cemetery of dreams because they don't have access to the education. They go to the city, go and work in the day, and they study in the night. How can I get, I have access to the education at the university? It's difficult. I remember my classroom with 60 children like me at sixth grade. Maybe 16 of us get to, the, to do seven, eight and nine grade. Maybe me alone had to reach to the university thanks to the that solidarity of our brothers and sisters from Cuba. Yes. It was never be possible for me to become a doctor, even from a young guy from my villages, to become a doctor because the price of a book 
is the money how did our father make for one year. Mm -hmm. People are fighting for to live to eat for to eat ten cents U.S. dollar ten cents per day. How can I afford a book for three thousand anatomy or physiology book to go to med school? Then that's the reality what we face in our country. But something was really important. That this spirit of Garifuna people will still speak their own language. I can say, when I was in the school, I'm talking to you in 19, I remember 1988, 89, there was a big sign in my school. You know, up to the, and front, in every classroom, who say, prohibit to speak Garifuna in this classroom. <laughs> it was a sign, signed by the Minister of Education, who prohibited to the black people to speak their own language in the classroom. You know, they were coming from a family who speak Garifuna. At whom? <laughs> That's the only language you know. <laughs> then when you get to a school, it was prohibited. When you speak Garifuna, mm -hmm. then the teacher hits you, you know? And you spend a holiday there with your knicks, with something on your head, because you speak your language. Then, this, my, this is the reality what I face in the school. This reality what I face in, in the society. But it's a reality what I face after I become a doctor. Then some people look at me with my white, white coat when I go to the store, and they say, oh, are you a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> but this was not only Andrew, they got experience in Spain. Huh? They invited me to give a, a, a conference in Spain, and they sent a guy to who was uh, Germany region to pick up me at the airport. And when I was in front of him, and he was with a sign like this, Dr. Luther Harry here. When I come and I start in front of him, I stand up and he put the sign to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> and I stand up in the other side. And, the <laughs> and he was seeing them, old person was going, going, he was waiting for somebody else. And afterward, it was, I was doing my left thing, I went and sit down there <laughs> and asked him after all, what time we're living. And he said, are you Dr. Luther? I said, yes. And he said, well, they didn't tell me that you were John. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's the same reality what we face, that the situation. But that has been a given a great strength to our people. We face the same reality as indigenous and ethnic people, the indigenous people. And we join together in a struggle. Then we have been fighting in the country for years and years. Then we, were, we talk about national resistance movement in Honduras. The black people didn't start their fight on 28th of June. We have been in resistance since we arrived to Honduras. That was it's very easy for us to join the process of resistance because there's a common fight that we have, you know, day by day to survive in the country. The National Autonomous University of Honduras was founded in 1847, and it was after 118 years the first black man became a doctor. Then we had to wait 118 years, and we have a 56 <coughs> community in Honduras that we fought, fight for the independence since we arrived in 1797 in the country. And there is no hospital in the Garfunda community. Then we built, since 2008, the first hospital in the Garfunda community. Then we had to wait 212 years for the first hospital that we built with our hands. And after we built it, they say that we are illegal <laughs> for providing free health care for our people. And this is the fight, what we face. And this is reality, even though it's Difficult to hurt, yeah, but that's the reality. And we fight every day in the process of uh, constructing people power, the concept of our communities. Then that's why our people have been fighting for bilingual education. We win the process, international process in 1994. Then the Congress have to approve the process of bilingual education at the school. It's a good, you know, battle for our organizations. And now, the same people who were allowing the sign of prohibited prohibit to speak Garifuna here, they have to learn Garifuna now to teach in the Garifuna school. It does mean 
the many of the reality because of the fight of our people every day. They have that spirit to fight for it. Now they are fight, facing a lot of problem in the hand and, and, and the process of the land. Because many of the land of Garifuna community, all the land are located next to the ocean. And this is the land was the land, biggest land owner, even the government wants to sell it to the more biggest company. Then that's why they kick out communities like uh, from Tela. You can hear about it and sell it to the more biggest companies and change. It was an article in the Constitution, 107 article in the Constitution, who prohibited to sell the land to foreign company. And now they changed the article. And now they're selling the land for biggest companies. Then. This is the, the process of the real, what's happened with Afro-descendants uh, reality, who is not too far from the indigenous reality, who is not too far from the campesinos reality. The only thing that campesinos have to fight because they are poor, we have to fight because we are black and we are poor. And indigenous have to fight because they are indigenous and they are poor. And we join together in this process of the national resistance movement to build a new country for our people. But the Latin American School of Medicine for us become a great space because since the foundation of National Autonomous University in Honduras in 1847, today we have more Garifuna studied medicine in Latin American School of Medicine in Cuba than all entire 150 years of existence of National Autonomous University in Honduras. <laughs> then if we go to the numbers of Garifuna doctors in my country, National Autonomous Honduras graduate one Garifuna doctor every 20 years. <laughs> if we go to the per capita of Garifuna doctor since the National Autonomous was funded. But only this year, the Latin American School of Medicine, we're gonna graduate 23 Garifuna doctors. Yeah. That's mean we we multiply. <laughs> How long gonna to take to the National Autonomous University to graduate 23 Garifuna? Let's <laughs> multiply for 25. <laughs> yeah. How many centuries are gonna be like this? Then Latin American School of Medicine for us, and thanks to the relation that we build in Cuba, because the Cuban government gave to Honduras 600 scholarships in 1999. They just sent 263 that, uh, uh, young people, and there were a lot of people looking for a scholarship, but they sent six Garifuna. But in 2005, that everybody was known that the Latin American School of Medicine was a reality, and that you can become a doctor. Then Cuba gave 200 scholarships to Honduras, then they don't send no Garifuna. And 2001, they said they give 150, they don't send no Garifuna. Then we speak directly with Commander-in-Chief Fidel, who has a big yes. heart. <laughs> yes. And I told Fidel, Commander, if the scholarship is going to be to wash ditches and clean floor, that would be full of Garifuna here. Why you don't help us? And he say, wow, you, want, you have Garifuna who are prepared to come? I say I have five or ten in my mind list. I she say, go to Honduras and pick up 20. <laughs> and when I reached to Honduras, the Minister of Health didn't want to sign the permit for those young fellows to, because, say, because he was saying, who is that black man who come here to put this lad to send black people to study medicine in Cuba? They would start to fight in the capital for two months in a strike to send those first 20 students to study medicine. Now are the same doctors who are working in our new hospital in Honduras, back in Honduras. But we did that exercise with, with Fidel every year, 14 space, and now we have been having 87 Garofuna studying in Cuba, not only in the area of medicine, uh, pharma, pharmacy, physiotherapy, building this process to educate human resources, to create the new model of healthcare who's gonna be free profession. Today, our hospital, Garofuna Hospital, is becoming the first hospital first fruit of Latin American School of Medicine reality, providing free health care. Until five days ago when we count, we have been attending 686,000 people for free. A little bit more than half million for free. Fighting 
our hospital, it was one of the military was broke the door and entered after the coup. Because represent danger for the system because it's showing that how much we can do with nothing. And that's a little bit the reality what we face in our country. And that's why we fight against to rebuild a new country for our people. Thank you. So let's open it up to the, uh, to the audience, uh, people. I want to start, uh, start at the very end of what you were talking about, which is um, at the, and earlier I had the same question. Where did the money and, and like physical resources come to put together the Garden for the Click? Did it come from mainstream Honduras money, or did it come from within your own community? Then it's difficult to say we have a statistic Where's the money is coming? Sometimes when we start this project, we were thinking when we were the students about how we design a model, and we were thinking about three good bases: human resources, infrastructure, and continuity and sustainability of the process. If we think about sustainability, we won't be able even to start a project. <laughs> because just a building coming from La Habana. I studied in Cuba. With the stipend that Cuban government gives to me, it was 100 pesos, five US dollars a month. Then I spent 30 cents every day to survive in Cuba, the school. Then we arrived to our villages without nothing, but with a bag full of hope. Then we, and, but with this decision to be do the construction of people. Then I don't have access here to the PowerPoint, but and we have a great picture and the first meeting that we have with the community, trying to convince people. No, telling the people that new hope was coming, but people didn't believe in nobody in our area. That politicians come every four years and, <laughs> and tell you we're gonna build a big bridge. And people say, but we don't have river. Then they say we're gonna build the river too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and people didn't believe in that. But how we can convince the people that a new, new, new conception of healthcare was coming? And then we had to. The same day, people donate a piece of land, and we clean it with the people and build a tent. But well, the same material from the community, and it's hard to look for donation of medicine, who is very hard, because all the people donate the medicine they don't want anymore. They is inspired, and but we have to do a strategy, and it start with ten people, and talking with each patient to donate a voluntary work to go to the construction, and we find a support, a small support for five five thousand US dollars from some of our brother from Sacramento. It was a, a brother who was a company of a sport. It was some African descendants who say, oh, hey, we have the company deal with 5,000. 5, and some of other brothers from the union of IFLC in Sacramento, they say, we will look so for some money with some voluntary people who donate to buy a bridge, rebar, and we do that effort together. And we build the building with the people. And we make some trips, talking about the projects, and we get the furniture. Cuba give us some of the equipment and Brazil and we set the what we have now. To the process of um, uh, sustainability, it's like it's not really sustainability, it's survive until now. We were there giving medical support. We opened an office just to move. We didn't find the 30, 30, 35,000 US dollar a month to, to give sustainability to the hospital. But we had to find it in medicine and materials, and food for doctors, and transfer gas for transportation, and everything. We some a brother who say, okay, we want to sponsor a trip, we want to sponsor some medicine, we want to sponsor, but more from international, outside the country, but not for institution, it's more for personal people who say, no, we will come to the other five, but we were a sponsor and ours for $3,000 per <coughs> year, and we can continue doing this work. Then this effort, before we sign agreement with President Celaya, before the, uh, two month, three months before the coup, we have the access. It was very short, you know, and he was in the government and did it and did too much, did too much for the hospital too. But now we're accompanying the process, you know. And uh, three months before the coup, we signed an agreement to pay three of our doctors. Then with that money, we pay 11. Then we piece the money in 11 and continue the process of working in the hospital voluntary. We open a small and uh, a small school for, nurse school for, uh, for single mother from 
single mothers from the community to train them as a human resource with the with, uh, with, uh, Cuban nurses support in the process. Then we did a three year, then we have six, six of our nurses who already finished their course, but we don't have money to pay them. But we, we're working in the process of this, uh, how to support this process. Then we designed this model not for Honduras. The Latin American School of Medicine had been graduating 10,000 doctors from 48 different countries. In two years, in three years, we will be 15,000. That will be the more biggest army of doctors in the world. In the world. Then now we have in Latin American School of Medicine more than 68 different countries. For now, this is small islands in Asia, Africa, and wherever in America. They become international school. The many of international organizations talk about healthcare for all. For all, they got the money, but we have the most expensive who is the human resources. We were talking about that in the conference of Black Caucus in Washington this last time, last September. And we were telling them, if you got the money, and we really want to do something for the healthcare in the world, we now we have the human resources, like how we did it in Haiti like how our doctors are willing to go anywhere <coughs> to contribute to this process. And we believe that only the doctor who was trained in Latin American School of Medicine, if we had a high level of science and consciousness, on, under the concepts revolutionary of Che Guevara, who was able to feel in the bottom of their heart any injustice against anybody in any part of the world can do that effort. Before uh, people leave, do you want to say something, Joe? Yeah. Well, on that note, I just wanted to suggest that we pass a uh, bucket for contributions for Luther's Hospital. Uh, Marco, there's a trade up front there, if you could uh, circulate that. People can make checks out either to just to Luther Castillo or to Peace Action Wisconsin, which is uh, acting as a fiscal agent for Luther here while he's in the U.S. I'd like to ask Ariel, I'd like to ask Ariel um, you know, sometimes um, the Cuban Revolution is presented as something uh, that has been done to blacks in Cuba, uh, that they're objects of the Cuban Revolution. But maybe you could say some things about uh, the role, uh, the participation of black, of African you know, Afro-Cubans in leading and participating in the crucial battles of the Cuban Revolution, the role of leaders like Juan Almeida or Victor Drake or Bombo in the initial struggles uh, in the Revolutionary War, or the role of uh, black Cubans in uh, the Bay of Pigs or the literacy campaign. Conception of Afro Cubans for me is a racist concept. We are Cubans. And the, as Cuban, we have the opportunity to fight and to stay present in the, the most important moment of the, uh, of the revolution. At the beginning, in the Sierra Maestra, in the battle of, of the Sierra Maestra. A lot of black, don't forget that the maybe the black, according with the color of the skin, we are no more than the 10% of the, all the, the, the total population. At, the, at that moment, in the Sierra Maestra battle, uh, three commanders uh, was 
black according with the color of the skin, of the skin. and uh, after that moment, a lot of black people uh, moved to the army force, and uh, before to move to the army force, uh, we are, were working in the national uh, alphabet, uh, national campaign, education campaign, and. Uh, I was a member of the, at that moment, I was a youth. And there was an opportunity to, to teach, to learn, and to write a song, old person near my home. And uh, this, the other moment has been the battle of, uh, of the Bay of Peak, uh, where, uh, where a lot of black people, they are members of the national revolutionary policy. Uh, they moved in, uh, to the Plairo, the Bay of Peak, and uh, during the October crisis, a lot of persons, a lot of blacks who are members of the, of the army. And uh, I'm so if you, uh, I explain you that it may be only in the case of the Africa, uh, we prepare some specifically uh, black people, black Cuban people, but at that at the same time was Ernesto Che Guevara with them, and uh, was uh, Jorge Rizquel with, with them together in the, in this fight, and uh, during the during the old battles of the international uh, problem that the Cuba has been. Uh, the conception of Fidel said that, uh, that the when we are, we are going to decide to open some uh, diplomatic uh, embassy in, in any part of the world, uh, in the United States or in the United Nations or Africa or in France, in other parts. He said that we must to present at the world the reality of the Cuban society. Uh, is he not accept that in some embassy, in the Cuban embassy, the embassy will be only white, but it must, because he said that this is no real face of the Cuban. We must to, to present uh, the, uh, the Cuban all uh, different colors of the skin. The other, uh, as you know, when the Che Guevara decided to move to the Bolivia, uh, two or three black people were members of the campaign. And when the, the, other, the, other, the other thing is when the Cuba decided to move uh, to the to the Algeria uh, at the beginning of the revolution, a lot of uh, black people moved to this uh, campaign. And I think that the, the Cuban art, the black people are present in all the more important moments of the, of the Cuban revolution. And, uh, and until now, this has been a, a a situation that the Cuba is increasing uh, the participation of, of not only thinking in the uh, as at the problem of the of the of the race, thinking that there is the right that the people need in the, in the not taking into account only the the consideration, the political consideration, but it's the right that the people need to uh, take part of the whole transformation in the Cuban, in the Cuban society. Uh, but the other thing that I would like to stress is that the, in our case, it's impossible to think in the same conception of the black that you have in America. It is impossible. When you make to translate the conception, you make a scientific mistake because it is not possible. Because, uh, my case maybe will be a good example. I have a, a grand, grand old mother 
uh, African, both my other uh, races, Spanish. I mix, my family mix uh, early in the, in the life, and uh, I mix with a, a, I continue mixing. I have five child, three of them are like me, black and two of them are not so black because we make a money with the Cuban uh, white women. And uh, this is, for this has been, this has been interesting, the Cuban history, because uh, we are mixed during a lot of, a lot of years. For this reason, it's impossible to talk about the afro Cuban or about the black uh, only black food is no real. It is a, a, it's another concession. The other thing that the that the uh, black people are members not only in international campaign and in national campaign. Uh, for me now, uh, I would like to to talk about the the good cane campaign or, or about the. The economic transformation in the Cuban society. The people have to work uh, with a different uh, problem. It is impossible. Maybe only at, at the level of the of the non-academic uh, concession, there uh, something is insisting to introduce the division in the Cuban society because we are black. Yeah, we are different black boys, but first of all, we are Cuban. It is uh, my point of view. We are Cuban. After that, we, we will be more black, more white, less black, less white, but we are Cuban. We are no Afro Cubans. We are no, uh, uh, it is in my perception, my perception, I respect the other conception, but because I consider that this kind of, of or consideration is provoke is try to provoke some division in the in the mind of the in the mind of the Cuban people uh, because we are different uh, different of other part we have not the same experiences of our colleague uh, colleague in Garufa uh, or in Venezuela we have another part of the in Venezuela the Costa Rica there is some of people that they have a different, a different, uh, a different history. But in our case, we have a common history. We have a lot of major, major and general in the in the world, in the independence world, that they were blacks. If you know something about the history, Antonio Maceo, Quintin Bandera, uh, a lot of general of the black Cuban a member of the Independence Army, and a lot of members of the, the Black Cuban are part of the of the society. And that that's the, in order to know uh, my point of view, in order to know what is happening in Cuba, it's necessary to go to Cuba. But don't forget that idea. Go to the wedding party go to the cemetery, go to the concentration in the Revolution Square, but if you seek a black in the, in, the, in, the, in the moving to the street and you say, this is a racism because the police is looking for me. No, no, it's, it's not a real perception of the, it's not a perception of the reality. You want to go to stay in Cuba. You must to go to the cemetery, you must to go to the wedding party, mm -hmm. and then you will be see who is the real relation in the race relation, who is the, re the reality of the race relation in Cuba. If you will be at that time, I will, I, will have, I will have the chance to invite you to go to the National Folkloric uh, Party, and the, this is an African <coughs> tradition in Cuba. But when you go to the party of the National Folkloric all the people are mixed together. They are dancing, they are singing, they are love, love the sea. Uh, if you want to take a cameo, to take a, a bus 
uh, you will be that the, in, in any part of the boat say only for black, or when in any part of the boat you say, no, the black you want to be out of it. Or if, the, if you want to take a taxi, you, you move together. It's important to know uh, which is our reality. And in order that, the, that the, you respect the, the conception, the tradition of the people, you will be received more wonderful uh, respect also. Other? I was wondering, uh, Dr. Castillo, if you could explain two things. One, and, and Salou, would you explain what it took to get to school, how early you had to get up in the morning? Could you kind of briefly go through that? And then could you talk about the prison fire that was in Honduras recently, and how many, uh, what the makeup of the prisoners were, mostly, like, mostly white, black, uh, uh, kind of revolutionary people, or who, was, who were in these prisons? I have to remind what I say in salute. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when people are young, ask a lot of energy and say a lot of things. But we're trying to do in a practice what we say. Salute is very interesting uh, documentary. And now it's a new documentary of uh, El Horizonte, Según El Che, who was made by, by Telesur. It's like a continuation of Salud. And Salud, we were talking with our students about our plan. And today, El Horizonte is talking about what we are doing now, you know, after we become doctors in different parts. And uh, featuring some of our companions in Venezuela and the Amazonas, featuring some of our companions working in the mountain with Mayas who are training in Latin American Fullest Medicine, featuring some of our companions working in Haiti. And, um, in other countries, you know, doing the murder, marvelous work. But I was born in a small village in Tocamacho, we call it. It's next to, it's in a mosquito in Honduras, very far, without electricity, and, uh, but without roads. <laughs> then, uh, in my village, I didn't have the opportunity to have seven, eight, and ninth grade, as it was only until sixth grade. <coughs> then we had to walk with other children, like two hours and a half, I get three hours to get to the to the to the um, to the next village to do my seven, eight, and nine grades. It was something every day. You mommy, I have to wake up two thirty in the morning and give you some we call tea because it's make it with uh, <laughs> and give you a piece of bread. But after you walk three hours, you know, you <laughs> <laughs> and you have to wait. Until you return to your home to eat at four o'clock. It was something that uh, my father used to say, you have to walk every day and you have to wake up every day and he used to wake up you every day and say that education is the only way to break the chain of your mind. You know? Something to say that we have to go to school. Every day. And something will become a culture in government society. Even though the children didn't have shoes, but they go to school to learn how to read and write. And uh, that's why even in literacy and the community is very, if we see the concept of those literacy to know how to write your name. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and this concept is very low in government society. I, but I think this reality give me that idea to become a doctor and uh, it was difficult. I tried to do it in Honduras before the scholarship to Cuba. I went to the city, I went to the capital and the study and then, and then and the study and the, and the night and go to work in the day and go to university. It was difficult even to go to my chemistry lab, biochemistry lab, you know. All the biochemistry lab I, in, the, in the morning, you know, and you were working, it was difficult to do it. And I found the real opportunity to travel to Cuba who, who changed my life. And, and it's not only me, there are many, like the American School of Medicine and, when I was the president of the school in 2004, 2005, there was 125 different ethnic groups from many part of the world. Who was something marvelous, you know? It was like a United Nation there, you know? Mm -hmm. Real uh, people who never dreamed become a doctor and say, wow. 
people who arrived to Cuba without learning Spanish, how they can learn Spanish and go to school. It was something who changed our life. And now returning back with this concept to be a doctor. Not only to see people as, a, as a anatomy, just uh, muscles and bones. This conception of biopsychosocial concept of medicine was very deep and accompanying the society in the process of development so is something. Now, we were involved in Honduras in the process of, of uh, a movement against the coup. <laughs> it is difficult to understand because people used to say, doctor, what are you doing there? You have to be in a hospital, you know? Who is the traditional way to do medicine? Yeah? You're there in the hospital, take care of you, your patient, and uh, from any bottom of the society, preferently from those <laughs> level of society that they can pay, get, you can get paid better. And then you can build, open your clinic in the more great area with beautiful nurses and chocolate and everything. <laughs> and you can get your patient. The other things that uh, you can run to the government and get five jobs and be omnipresent and you don't need to go there and government pay you and do what you have to do. But I was trained on a different concept. I'm proud to say that since I finished the school, I never charged no patient to, you know, to give them that free health care. Because we believe that health care is a human right. You know. But what we leave, people even have right to leave. <laughs> it's got to be the exchange yeah. concept of human right, the first one. People don't have right even to leave. Then this reality give us the opportunity to join the process in Honduras to fight to rebuild a new country. That concept give us, even though the Salah didn't contribute to the process of a hospital too much, to join the proposal for the survey 28th of June. Because we were, we, were, we were accompanying that process how we can ask people if they were able, uh, not if they were able, to ask people what they think how they have to leave. Then that was we accompanied this process 28th of June to do a simple survey, a simple question to people. Are you agree to set an election up? November, a battle. Four battle. And then this four battle, and we say four battle because in Honduras they, they said always three battle. One to vote for the mayor, one another to vote for the president, another one to vote for the Congress. Then we were proposing the Another battle, just to ask people, are uh, you agree to do some change mm -hmm. and some article of constitution? Because our constitution was written under the military government. Without the right of children, without the right of our women, without the right of our indigenous, without the right of our descendants, without, without the right of our workers. But you, need, you can see that the right of our private company to extend to pay the taxes. Then if you are selling two eggs and one tomatoes, next to your house, you have to pay taxes, but right? you don't understand why Burger King, Pizza Hut, and all those biggest things, they don't pay no taxes, and they don't introduce nothing in the country. Then we were willing to accompany that, because we believe the doctor has to be in the front line to defend the society. With this concept of doctor, we accompanied the process in the capital. Then the two coup attack came. I had opportunity to be with President Selaya until 3.30 in the morning. He sent me home to prepare a program for television and, and return to the presidential house at 6 in the morning. Then they kidnapped him, kicked him to 6. Uh, it was difficult to do <laughs> things together. He was kidnapped by the military, taken by me in a military car. I took it to the military airport and dropped by the military in Costa Rica. But before that, they landed in U.S. base mm -hmm. yeah. to get a yeah. permit where they have to drop him. But this process, Give up, make us involved in this process in Honduras. But the reality of prison in Honduras is some continuation of those strategic to destroy the poor people. Because that's not the first one what happened in Honduras. Some years ago, in the same presidency of this national party, in Maduro's presidency, they born 97 young people in a, in a prison in La Ceiba. But after that, two years after, they born more than 148 in the prison of Santa Cruz. 
And today, some weeks ago, in the prison of Comayagua, they put 80 people in a small space like this, another 80 in another space, another 80 in another space. And they born 436 people in an hour. And after that, the president come to the television and say, oh, we're sorry, it was a cigarette who born a bed. And a bed born every hour. Ah, but it thinks it was, nobody knew where was the key. And all those more than 400 people was screaming for life. But the other face is the international observator come, and they say that it was an accident. Too. Mm -hmm. As you see, it's the strategy. And to say, we don't hear nothing about this in news right now. Just the first two days where the blow is alive. That's the only time when, but now until today, from those 438 people, they return like 40 bodies to their family. And they return it, you know, days after in this composition. You can see in somebody in YouTube and some realities. But they give it you in a box that you cannot open it. But many of the family who have been opening the box, they see shooting, you know, in the head and the body of them. Oh, gee. We want to know where the fire can do that. You know, but even the professional who came, they select professional who came from different area. And to say, and approve this propaganda that military and government is repeating in the newspaper. That's a big reality until today. There will be hundreds of people in the street next to the place where they have the body in this composition waiting for them to give them a box of the family. But they're waiting for answer. And this big society, big strategy, who was designing, more than 50% of those people who were in this fire and this tragedy, young fellows who were not guilty. They never passed for the process of the, they say that they were guilty. They were waiting for the process just to say if they were guilty or not. But it's difficult living in this process after the coup attack where the violation of human rights more high, where our country has been converted the country more dangerous for journalists. Only one month, nine journalists died, and we can talk about many lawyers who died, lawyers who died in the process, professors who died, campesinos who died. More than 58 campesinos just from the one movements have been dying in the last six months. That means that someday they killed seven, four people in a one. And we're still accepting the uh, the business that those people who are still killing people in Honduras are doing <laughs> with many companies in the United States. I think we have, we think that we have, we are calling for the company of those brothers and sisters who can join in the efforts with solidarity with Honduran people. Because you don't hear nothing in the newspaper because the new people is belong to the oligarchy. You don't hear nothing and the television, the got television has belonged to the oligarchy. And those me media is the one that you can get online. The only way to spread the word is like inviting brothers to come here to talk about reality, to send information to our brothers here, to our brother organization who can spread the word. Then you can be making your contribution by helping us to spread the word, accompanying us in the process of Honduras, supporting the action of solidarity to denounce the violation of human rights even to go more far, to go to the company who do business with those people. I think those people only make, only can have, you know, can feel something if you affect, you touch their economic interests. Mm -hmm. They don't feel nothing if they kill many people in Honduras. Mm -hmm. We don't do nothing by making a big march in front of the embassy and burn any flag in front of there. 
they don't, you know, that's because been becoming a traditional <laughs> cultural action in all part of the world. <laughs> you know, maybe in Cuba not, because I didn't see that. If that fire took place in Cuba, if prison fire took place in Cuba, it would be all over the news. Yeah. <laughs> then, <laughs> it would be on every newspaper every day, newspaper. it happened in Cuba. So Just you know, with a hunger strike in Cuba for months, uh, over the newspaper, but 438 people in Honduras, nobody's talking about that now. Uh -huh. right. And the body are still there, out, you know, in the field out, with, you know, everything eating the bodies, you know. And uh, nobody say nothing, you know, and no media say nothing. But I think this is a process that we are struggling for. Even though it's dangerous, it's more easy to be in your house and taking care of your patient than fighting against those 14 family who has the army, who has the system, and has the support of many of the fellows, international support. I was not surprised because I had the opportunity to read the history of Latin America. But since the coup, it was not action of the military in Honduras. It was something prepared internationally. Dimitri Negroponte visited Honduras in April to carry out the action. You didn't know about history. Somebody had been reading about history in Latin America. And he met with the strategic people in April. An auto race go in May. And the coup come <laughs> after we decided in July something. That I, sometimes I make joke with Patricia Roda, who was the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Hey, Patricia. You was fighting for Cuba to return to the Organization of the States of America. That was in Honduras. <laughs> to take out the, in Honduras, we had a great movement there where they sent more than 100 people from Miami in a big hotel to fight against this law that was approved in Honduras to how we can take out the condition that, the, that they had against Cuba in the Organization of the States of America. Now Cuba has option to return if they want or didn't want, but the condition is not there anymore. And those fights took place in Honduras. But the other reality it was that Celaya come from the traditional government. The oligarchy didn't support him to get to the presidency because they were thinking that there was a more ignorant man that they can handle in the process. But the thing is when the Celaya started to travel in the country and see the pain of people, and they start to return a little things like a food for children, the school, electricity, and at, and at that time the the gallon of gas it was in 115 lempiras. It's like a five and something to a U.S. dollar. Mario, it was a Marcial five and something like this. It was 115. And so I say, okay, why we don't buy gas from Venezuela? The same part where those company from United States who sell gas to us go and buy. And they got the gas first action and buy the gas from Venezuela. And the price dropped from 115 to 45. And people start to say, what, well, that's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they were saying the news, the communists were coming to eat the children. <laughs> and, you know, and, and people start to say, wow, because the price of the eggs were going down, the rice and beans, you know, because transportation is with gas, you know, from 100 to 45, everybody was feeling, you know. And afterwards, they say, okay, we're going to join the Alba and much, you know, and, and tractors were coming to Campesino to produce the land, and people were accompanying the process. And some phenomenon happened, something difficult, you know. Celaya get to the power with a little difference between his opposition and win the presidency. When the, but when the same win party, you know, oligarchy made the survey six months before he finished his presidency, he was most famous than the two candidates of the traditional party together to run for president. And this phenomenon never happened before in Honduras because in the last year, the president didn't govern in the country. Are the two candidates for president for the traditional party because people are looking to keep their job and, you know, and, and, and survive. And that phenomenon happened. And at the same time, they were 
putting people, asking people, okay, you want to join the process of rebuilding the country, rewrite the constitution. And those 14 families get afraid just to listen to the voice of those they have been condemning for a year and a year to be the more miserable in the country. Then the coup happened. And after that time, the only things, we were right for lobby in Washington, the more biggest lobbies were in Washington supporting the coup, introducing yeah. the resolution in Washington, D.C. Lani Davis is introducing the resolution 635. <laughs> How can you fight against the more vigorous lobbyists? <laughs> you know, in Washington, D.C., they can put in a room 50 Congress and, and display the war. They have the money to do it. Mm -hmm. And you can look for some interview with someone to tell the truth. They were lobbyists introducing resolution to support the coup, but they were lobbyists introducing the resolution to support the illegal election under the coup. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they were everything set in San Jose, Costa Rica, <laughs> who was something who, Celaya didn't decide it, it was coming directly from Washington to say, okay, Costa Rica, we're gonna solve the thing mm -hmm. and play games in Costa Rica. Yeah. And playing games and playing games to get to the day of election. Mm -hmm. And they signed the agreement of Costa Rica and they say, okay, everything is okay, but now I don't care about Celaya and the Embassy of Brazil. Don't worry. We go to election. And they go to election under the coup, they go to election under the repression, they go to election under, under the assassination and win the election. Win the election with the same Supreme Court, with the same public ministry, with 82% of the same Congress who support the coup attack. Mm -hmm. yeah. With the famous government of integration, being the Minister of Communication, the same general who were leading the coup. Then the same reality, that same, the reality didn't change. And a strategy to continue killing people. To can continue killing poor people who are the more strongest parts of resistance movement in the country. Mm -hmm. Who is not a governmental strategy. That mixed now with some international effort to continue making weak the effort of Honduran people to do the construction of a new country. Any catch there, Park? Could you answer the question about the percentage of blacks? in the uh, incarceration in the penal system? The percentage of blacks versus whites or Latinos in the uh, prison system in, the in prison Honduras? Prison system in Honduras? This part is not uh, too high like the other country. We're talking about maybe 5% in, uh, in uh, the population of African descendants in Honduras is 12% of all the population. And, um, and, um, but even though it's a little bit far, it's high. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like the US. Yeah, yeah like the US. <laughs> and, uh, but it's the same reality, you know. Then, um, because if you don't have a good lawyer, you will get out. Then nobody's in jail because they took out the billions who were coming for the children's program. Mm -hmm. But you can be in jail for 25 years for getting an orange. <laughs> I'm talking about reality. We have cases about that. <laughs> you know, Rob, taking out the eggs from some yard. You can be 25 years in the jail. You know? And uh, and uh, that's the portion that we don't, I don't, I won't tell you, I have the real statistic now in my hand, but it's approximately what I'm talking about. Having even the percentage of of people, of Garfina who died in the, in the, in the, in the, in the prison in La Ceiba were very high because the communities are very, uh, very close to La Ceiba, more than Comayagua. Then they die more in San Pedro Sula, like, like a 25%, die more like a 30% in La Ceiba than the people who die now. And by the same people who the same origin, I let them out poor. 
<laughs> if that's a common in all those people who die in the in um, in the prison of uh, of Comayagua. Thank you. A question about medical care in, in um, Honduras. There are an awful lot of American groups who go down to Honduras and stay for a month or two weeks and give out antiparasitics <coughs> and some antibiotics and then they leave. How do you think, what do you think about that and how do you think those groups could maybe be more helpful? to especially the mosquito people and, and people with your they go fun of people as well. All the, you know, every, where there are no roads and no water and uh, these issues is then very uh, important to discuss. I have been I have been very optimist to get the uh, to how we can make the work of the brigades more effective and Honduras. It's difficult to go and solve the problem by about the cancer. What do you think can be the solution in Honduras without getting information, uh, getting studying the reality of what's going on with healthcare in the area? Because the simple the simple action to break, buy warm medicine, parasite medicine from here, without say, without knowing which kind of warm or parasite are in the area where you're gonna work, <laughs> and you can buy any warm medicine and give it to the people, you know, you can, you can, you can, you can kill people with that. You can. Uh, you know, how can be the immigration of Ascaris lumbricate the coide? What I see in some of Genesis, they can out from the ear, from the nose, from the eyes of many children, because they are not taking the real medication for this kind of worm and parasites. But in the poor country, where we don't have another choice, where we don't have another help, all the help is welcome. But I can tell you what we are doing now in our project. Because sometimes you have to deal professionally with this kind of work. Any brigade who come to work with us, we have to make sure if the people are doctor or no. Because if you want a treat person, you gotta be a doctor or a nurse. If veterinarians are traveling, I, I have to make sure that veterinarians bring medicine for animals and take care of the animals who are living among the people in the community. You know. And you have to say before what is your skill. Or if you are voluntary that you don't know how to do things, you want us to give you something to do. And we can discuss with you what we have to do. This method can sometimes confront the process of some of the brigades who are already in the culture of reaching to the country to do their plan. But for us, it has been very helpful to join the process of the plan with many of the brigades from Alabama, a group we call AMEN, Alabama Honduran Institution for Medical, and another group we, they call CHIMES, California Honduran Institute for Education and Medical Support, who work with those bringing brigades every three months. We have even a medical congress with them we not only for doctors, for many people who work in healthcare, only people who work in social movement, but we have this medical conference every August. We always finish the Congress 13th of August and celebrate today's birthday. But, <laughs> but uh, it's been very interesting work we do together. I can tell you some of my experience. I, I was invited to Birmingham to a conference where the head of the brigade was discussing their plan to go to Honduras. And I saw, very surprised, I was very surprised there, and the flash and a PowerPoint that some doctor, the head of one of the brigade was presenting, and one of his objectives it was teaching values. And I said, wow. Just <laughs> <laughs> mean that you don't recognize that my people have values. Have values. <laughs> Think that you're gonna be teaching values. Yeah. <laughs> That's the concept to think that the values who are not like you values are not values, you know. 
But this has been very important because many of our, the doctors who travel to work with us have been understand what is the objective of the work what we are doing. You can solve the problem by accompanying the people who are in the area working in a program for healthcare. You know, I'm working with the midwife. You know, you have to ask me what you have to do with the midwife and set and show you the program where we are in the program of the midwife and you can help in the process. We have some brother who came from building project from California with midwife from the US and we we have this workshop with midwife from Honduras and said something was being very great for good for women in the in the area, and we join the work together. But we think that that can be more effective if the brigades here 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 join the work with some facilities or some group of people who are really working in Honduras and understand the process of healthcare. But Kigas is not only it's not a church who got to be working in the process of healthcare. Let let the church work in evangelistic process. Let the doctor work in the process of healthcare. Because they will understand it better. They will understand what we are doing. The problem of high blood pressure in a patient who are changing medicine every week with any brigade who came, you can know what resistance it can have for that part with that blood pressure. The problem of the warm, who are getting many types of warm medicine, just a small piece. You can know the process, how it's going to be. But to work together with the people who are working in the area, we work a lot in the process of preventive health care. We go house by house making a file for each family. But we have a pro program for breast cancer, who is not the traditional program who are looking to say, OK, wow, how many breast cancer do you diagnosis? Wow, 45%? That's good, high. That's good for surgery. How many surgery you make? Which technique you apply? That's not our goal. Our goal, if we found the breast cancer, then we treat the breast cancer. But we are looking for the behavior of the community who prevent the breast cancer. Then we found out in our study that 95% of our women give breast, 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 breast feeds for their children, breast feed. Then how are we going to work to encourage the people to continue doing that or increasing the 100%? That's our way to tradition and to fight the disease. Then we find out that 92% of the women in the community didn't smoke cigarette. How we can encourage that? Continue people no smoke and increasing to 100%. Then we can fight the breast cancer by doing that. But how can we use the culture of the people not only to dance, no? mm -hmm. to educate the population? Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, artists with us in this movement doing concert with healthcare promotion, and is the brigade accompanying us in the process? We can make a better job for those poorest of the poor. Because when you arrive to the company, to the village, you don't understand how a month of people who are coming, and they don't have nothing maybe. But they say, "Ah, oh, my head is hurting me, my stomach is hurting me. You know, I have chills," because they need the medicine. They don't know where the other brigade we can arrive, and they are 27 hours from the more nearest hospital. Sometimes you don't understand why people have a lot of symptoms. No, they need to tell you a lot of symptoms. They need a medicine. And we believe that many brigades are coming, but we can be working better if we link the work together with many people who are working back home, and we can go do a better uh, job for those people who really need almost nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, I'm going to ask August to say some closing remarks. But first I'm going to make one plug. That is, um, there's a film showing tomorrow night here um, called Three Muses by a British Ghanaian um, filmmaker. It starts at seven. It's five dollars. And so if you would like to check it out, you can check it on our website. Um, or just drop by and um, watch it. It starts at seven. We'll go about uh, an hour. Um, August, could you close us out, please? Well, I uh, just want to thank everyone really for being here and uh, having an opportunity to listen to both uh, uh, Luther and Ariel, and at least for me, to hear about uh, Honduras in a way I've never heard about Honduras. And it uh, was really quite, uh, it was really instructive. And so uh, I was thinking about a lot of the parallels here with the U.S. And, 
through the, the, uh, the health care situation here in the U.S., and the, uh, the crisis, uh, the incarceration rate for African Americans, and, uh, the uh, increasing, uh, uh, increasing non-use of uh, juries, people going to trial, uh, not going uh, without a people being shot. Exactly. All right. <laughs> And so, uh, so yes, while uh, both Cuba and uh, Honduras have very different realities, uh, uh, still part of a, part of a, a broader, broader struggle uh, to advance the interests of working people. And this is what the Cuban Committee tries to do uh, with programs like this, is to break down the, inf the information barrier. And we really appreciate uh, those who come out tonight, again, both uh, Mario and uh,